Thank you. Hi, everyone. I guess I have to say the obvious thing that I'm standing between you and drinks. So um, we're going to try to make this fun. And by fun, I said, let's talk about magic. I mean, not Penn and Teller type of magic, but spark magic, you know, the kind of magic that helps us do interactive data exploration and machine learning about five to 10 times faster. The same kind of magic that made the mean time between failures for our spark jobs go up by about 800%. And the kind of magic that when our jobs do fail occasionally, helps us do root cause analysis in minutes, usually less than five minutes, as opposed to say more than five hours. It makes sense to tell you a little bit about what Swoop is about. We do search advertising, so we're kind of a cross between Google's two crown jewels, AdWords and AdSense. Um, we have absolutely nothing to do with the annoying, big, flashy ads you see online. We hate them just as much as you do. Uh, we actually show very small, very uh, engaging ads that perform way better than this other stuff. And the reason why we can do this is because we're pretty good at optimization. We manage a dynamic marketplace with over 100 million users, peaking at request volumes over 10,000 a second, data reaching petabyte scale. And uh, we don't have a very big team. So we like to do things sort of easily. And when we solve a problem, we like it to stay solved. The data stack is very, very simple. Spark is the unifying data platform. We not have a core competency in managing Spark clusters, so we do this for Databricks. Everything goes into Spark. Uh, machine learning is done both on and off Spark. Analytics data goes to Redshift. We consume that for Looker, or more like our business users consume it for Looker because they don't like writing SQL, surprisingly. Because a lot of the interactive exploration is done in Spark, let's take probably one of the simplest possible examples. Say we have a table of the views and clicks for each one of our ads over some period of time, and we want to turn this into a table by account and campaign, and maybe we want to add the click-through rate, you know, the rate at which the ads are being clicked. You know, couldn't be couldn't be simpler than that. So how do you do that? Well, let's uh, see what a notebook looks like. Whoa, this is uh, quite exciting. Let's get the maximum zoom level that still keeps it on screen. So something like this is about as basic as you would do it on Spark. You know, you would start with the ads table. You will then join the accounts table to get the account name. You will join the campaigns table to get the campaign name. You will group by the names. You will sum the views in the clicks. You would add a calculated column, which is the click-through rate. You format it for humans as a percentage. You'll then order by counting campaign again, purely for the humans. And if you run this, you get the expected result. Nothing, absolutely nothing fancy here. The account names and campaign names, I pass them for an anonymizer so that we don't expose who we work with. Uh, is this magical? No, it is not. It's powerful, it's convenient, but it's absolutely no different than what you can do in SQL. In fact, it reads about the same. But it can be magical, and magic looks like this. The reason why this is magical is because we didn't have to tell Spark anything about how to do what we wanted it to do. We just said, hey, do this for me. You know, I have the ads table, summarize it by counting campaign, add the CTR column and then humanize it. Turn the data in all its full precision, et cetera, into something that humans can consume. Note that we said CTR, but the column is actually CTR PCT to indicate to a human that it's a percentage, and so on and so forth. All the other numbers also actually got commas thousands formatting, which we didn't have in the original Spark code. By the way, for all this and for um, any other of the demos that I'm going to show, you can get the code by just sending me an email at spark at swoop.com. Now let's kind of go under the covers of how Spark does the work. So we're going to take this code, which is a slightly reformatted version of the code you saw before, and we're going to color it. Like, you know, little kid coloring book. We're going to use red for what we ask Spark to do. We're going to use blue for how we tell it to do it. And we're going to use green for human sort of consumable output. And it looks like this. You see a little bit of red for all the things we have to tell Spark, like which table you're starting with, what columns you want to aggregate by, and the fact that you want the CTR. But there's a whole lot of blue. 
There's a whole lot of blue because Spark is a general purpose platform. And as a general purpose platform, it makes no assumptions about our data. And because it makes no assumptions about data, we have to tell it every single little bit about our data. And then you have the little bits of green having to do with the human formatting. If we also want a thousand separated sums and views, there will be even more green intermixed with the blue. And that's a problem. That's a problem because when you get these intermixed dependencies, you have the beginning of what we technically term spaghetti code. And the more you have of this, the more little use cases you add, the more drag you're going to have over time. The slower and slower you're going to get. The more time you're going to take to tweak your code to have it do exactly what you want. Google actually published a paper about it. I mean, yes, the problem exists in traditional data analysis and data exploration, but it is especially a big problem if you're doing machine learning. And most of machine learning, for those of you who practice it, know it actually has to do with feature engineering. The training is not that hard. The hard part is feeding something into the training and feeding the right thing and then tuning the training and evaluating the results. And I highly recommend for any one of you who's doing data engineering for machine learning or doing data science to look at this paper because it talks about this problem of accumulating technical debt. We have another issue in the normal way we write Spark code, is that we make it dependent on the input data. In Swoop, we like Google, we have keywords and we have ads, so we could have asked the same kind of computation to happen using the keywords table. But in that case, we would have to change the IDs and tell Spark exactly how to join the keywords table. And that doesn't feel very magical, so let's see what would happen if um, we ask the magical code to do this. Wow, it just worked. Why is that? Well, it worked because the what didn't change. Only the how changed. So the key point about magical APIs is that they take care of the devil in the details. They just focus on what it is you want to do. And kind of don't ask you to worry about anything that you don't have to. And if you think there's enough devil in the details doing exploration, well, there's a lot of devil in the detail when you're actually talking about operationalizing data flows. So let's talk about this next. Now, we like to do bulletproof processing, by which we mean we want it to run for long periods of time without failure. And long periods of time here is very, very critical. It's very easy to make something run once, twice, but have it run for months, handle schema changes, handle evolutions in data, evolutions in cluster, topology, etc. That's much, much harder. And when it occasionally fails, and it always does fail sometimes, you actually want the resolution of the failure to be very, very swift. Or at least understanding why it failed, the root cause analysis, to be extremely swift. So let's look at probably the simplest real world problem. Pretty much every company that deals with big data has some long-lived collections. And when you have long-lived collections of data, you're going to need to add the next bit of data to them. Whether that's a micro batch or whether that's a big batch, it doesn't really matter. But you have the append the next batch problem. And depending on how you manage your data, you probably have the append the next batch problem to some kind of file system, let's say S3 or object store. Um, and you also probably have the same problem with some data aggregates, probably in a SQL store. Well, in our case, and probably in your case, 90% of job failures have to do with I.O. problems. Computing in the cloud is unreliable. Machines fail, networks are bad. So what's the simplest way to deal with an I.O. failure? Couldn't you just retry the job? Well, yeah, you could if it was idempotent. Idempotency, for those of you who don't know, is a property that allows an operation to be retried without changing the outcome. rm-f file name is an idempotent operation. Appending is not idempotent. You keep adding. So that's a problem. Spark has only one idempotent save operation, and that's save mode overwrite. I would strongly encourage you to use absolutely no other save mode ever, because idempotency is a wonderful property of jobs. The problem with save mode override is that it's all or nothing. It will override the entire table. So you can't use it directly, but Spark is obviously flexible and extensible enough and has a clean API, so we can do something ourselves. 
So how will we do that? Let, let's start with the SQL case because it's easier. In SQL, this pattern has been long studied and long solved, and some people actually call it the SQL merge operation. So what you do is you write your chunk of data into a temporary table, and then transactionally, if hopefully a database supports that, you delete anything in your target table related to your chunk, whether it was there or not, and then you insert all the data from the staging table into the target table, and then you clean up. Pretty simple. Yeah, but when you're dealing with big data in the cloud, simple things are actually complicated. Spark, the wonderful property of its data frame APIs in a Spark SQL, it doesn't care about column ordering. SQL very much cares about column ordering. SQL gets very, very nitpicky about schema changes. There are cross-database issues. There are index management issues. So actually, this is a perfect example of a situation where describing what it is you want done is extremely simple. Here's a data frame with the next batch. Here's where I want it. Just do it for me. And the implementation is actually quite complicated to get it to be clean and impotent such that when it fails, you can just rewrite it, uh, rerun it, and it will just work. It's a perfect opportunity for a magical API. And that's one of the ones we have. Behind the scenes, we actually have to do schema inspection of the remote database, SQL code generation, and so on and so forth to get it just right and avoid all the kinds of problems that I have scars on my back from. Now let's look at the Spark case when we actually want to write to something like S3. Well, we have a problem. The SQL pattern depended on ability to delete. Well, you can't delete things in a Spark table. So you can't really handle this problem in Hive managed tables. You have to manage your tables directly in the file system. We do this using a pattern called resilient partition tables, which is actually a data pattern. For those of you who don't know what partition tables are, they're uh, a way to save data that I think Hive pioneered that simply puts your data in several different directories. And then it puts actually some columns from your data on the path. Like in this case, you see year, month, day, hour are on the path. That makes it very easy for the query engine to actually decide which files it should process. Essentially, it does sort of like a two-stage query, first one on the directory tree to find which files to process, and only then, you know, sort of scanning, scanning the files. So maybe we can just implement this idempotent append operation just by writing deep into one of the subdirectories that is for our, our batch. And again, sounds simple, but the devil's in the details. So you have all kinds of problems. The file systems we use for big data are not atomic file systems. They're eventual consistency file systems. And sometimes eventual means like very eventual. There are people who've noticed 12 or 24 hour delays for consistency to arrive on S3. It's very rare, but it's there. So if your data actually is important operationally, that's not something you can easily sort of take on faith. There are other problems. You know, you can have multiple clusters. What happens if somebody else is consuming the data that you're about to overwrite? Well, there's a wee bit of a problem, obviously. Um, you have problems with schema changes. You have problems with how Spark does dynamic partition discovery. When you point it to a directory tree, and it happens to be one of those partition table directory trees, how does it actually figure out that you have a year, month, day, hour column? To solve this problem magically, we now have to make some assumptions about how the data is laid out in the system. And we use a data pattern called resilient partition tables. I won't go into the details. Again, send me an email, spark at and um, I can tell you more. But basically, you need at least two levels of partitioning. One that identifies your batch. In this case, we use time with minute granularity. And one which identifies an individual write operation. Because what you learn is that you never actually want to overwrite the same thing. You always want to write a new thing, especially on S3, where you actually have read after write consistency, but you don't have overwrite or delete um, immediate consistency. And then we actually use a third degree of partitioning called category, which we use for root cause analysis and a bunch of other things, which, which I'll show you in a few minutes. And there's an example path of what this looks like. So let's talk about root cause analysis. Here's the classic problem. 
you're just going to process a whole bunch of data and some number of bugs and or data quality problems are going to cause certain number of errors and an unknown number of those errors in the batch of data you're going to process. So in our example, I just randomly picked 100 million, generating 1,000 errors of five different companies. So the problem is you actually want to find and fix all the problems. How are you going to do that? Well, there's two standard ways of doing it. The first one is the fail fast way. The moment you have an exception, you stop. Maybe you print something in the logs, and then the data engineers and the data scientists show up and start figuring out what went wrong. Typically, in those cases, you don't know which record you failed on. Because very often, if you think about the way we organize code, the point that generates the exception doesn't actually have the information, the full amount of context we want to actually diagnose the problem. So very few people do this way of working in big data, but occasionally I hear about it. Uh, the, the other issue with it is that at minimum, in this case, you have to run the job six times. Because assuming it takes you only a single run to sort of fix an issue, you have five issues to discover. So that's five runs, one per issue. And then the sixth one to actually get it right. So not a very good idea. <laughs> so what people do is they take the alternative approach, which is, well, I'm never going to stop. I'm just going to log errors. And you have the problem of actually correlating and organizing all this error information from the logs. And Spark logs are not quiet. They're not structured. And even if you use something like Logstash for structured logging, it's just a real pain in the neck. Well, if you're at Swoop, you would do something like this. So you would um, load only the bad portion of your data after you run. And this is the um, parcat equals bad at the end, which is why we use a third level of partitioning at minimum. And then you're going to say, well, first, I want to look at a summary of the errors in this data. Because there are expected errors and there are unexpected errors. For example, we use JSON as our input from our front end. And if you're on a mobile device and the network gets cut off, you're going to end up with half a JSON packet. Very common. So some invalid JSON is very expected. It only becomes a problem if we see it at a very high rate. And then we start worrying about something going wrong with the client. There are other kinds of problems. Sometimes people integrate Swoop incorrectly into their sites. So those are expected errors. So the error summary just kind of gives us a little bit of information about what is going on. Uh, and believe me, this works a lot better on a 30-inch screen. Uh, but let me see if I can get a little bit more from this. But basically, it tells us how many errors of a particular kind are there. What percentage of the total errors of this run are there? In this case, 83 errors. This is, by the way, production data. Um, this is uh, October 1st of last year at uh, midnight Eastern, which happened to be a particularly naughty, um, naughty hour error-wise. Um, we know this particular invalid JSON is a known one because it has actually an unknown issue ID. And there's a whole sort of useful set of information here, including it can be multiple causes, multiple issues, and a full stack trace with all the details you would ever want. There's even the actual source of the JSON that caused the problem. But, you know, expected errors we don't care that much about. What is really interesting here is that here is the unexpected errors. There are 57 of 29.4% of the total errors without a known issue ID. Those are things we didn't expect. Those are the problems we actually care to drill into. And so let's do that. In this case, I'm just going to ask for the unknown error summary. And I'm going to provide a parameter, com.swoop. Well, when you get exceptions in your code, often they're from, from deep inside the guts of some framework, like no pointer exception. Or in Scala's case, none.get, which is the no pointer dereference equivalent. Well, that's not a very useful location. So you have to start reading the stack trace to find your application code. Well, I don't want to do anything by hand that is the same all the time. I ask my software to do it for me. And so in this case, um, I'm telling Spark, hey, my code sort of starts with com.swoop. That's, that's our package name. And so let's see what we get. Behind the scenes, that's about 100 lines of SQL or Scala DSL going on. There's 
three levels of nested arrays in the actual data structures to produce what we just saw happen in a second. But it is, but it's pretty well optimized. So here's one. We got 47 counts, or 82.5% of all the errors of, guess what, none.get, the equivalent of no point reference. And then here it says, hey, look, the actual exception was here. But the first time I'm seeing your app, com.swoop on the stack is here. Oh, this has to do with goal external click. Goals are what we're trying to achieve when we execute. We have an optimization system. It doesn't just optimize for how much money we make, but it actually optimizes based on a very kind of complex balance of how much money we make, how well we do for all our partners, and how well we actually engage users. The particular event is UA. That's a user action event. Uh, more details in the example, and again, the specific, uh, one specific input element of how we do this. And there is another error like that uh, down below, which I think is the uh, other one. It can't find uh, a required field. So somebody's producing JSON in our event format that is not quite up to its, up to its spec. This is what I call magical. So how does it work? Obviously, there's some code. But again, there's some data patterns behind it. And in this case, the pattern is a Spark record. A Spark record is like an envelope around your data. It provides a few very important bits of metadata. It gives you the ability to essentially have a structured log per row of output. It also actually lets you produce rows that have no data. Because sometimes, you know, the general data processing pattern is m input rows into 0 to n output rows. All right, so sometimes there may be an issue that prevents you, that makes no sense, there is no data to produce, but there is an actual issue error, or even an informational message you want to collect that wants to go out with the output. It also can give you data chain of custody, output source, batching, and a few, and a few other important bits of information. The most important thing about Spark records is that they're a transparent data pattern, which means that you can use them, you can get the benefits of them, but then you can actually just process your data as if they didn't exist. And this is what you do for this. What this query does is effectively says, hey, I know that you're represented as a record when you're safe, but then just give me the data and, by the way, very efficiently ignore all the error records records that have no, no data or have data with an error associated. And features is a 32-bit bit field that we use to indicate information and do extremely fast filtering because in, integers is the fastest thing to process by big data systems, and parquet files can do predicate pushdown. So this is actually evaluated all the way down in parquet. And by the way, the other way to do this, um, if you're using it in conjunction with resilient partition tables, is simply to say, and parcat not equal bad. And that actually won't even have to look at the file. My call to action to you today is to actually start thinking about creating your own magic with Spark. And the problem is that magic requires intent. If your goal is not to create magical solutions with Spark, not to create magical APIs for whoever you provide APIs to, you never will. You will end up building something like the generic Spark processing API. And it's good for generic data. No company has generic data. Even a consulting outfit, which keeps getting different data from their customers, try to build some patterns for consistent data processing. And so my point is it often takes so little effort to apply some knowledge about your own data, about your own processing models, to actually elevate your work to sort of the magical level and to get the kinds of gains that we've seen at Swoop. So here's the checklist. Here's how you can check whether what you're using is magical. Is it simple? Is it focused on the outcome as opposed to the actions to produce the outcome? Is context managed implicitly as opposed to explicitly by passing a whole bunch of parameters and IDs? Does it imply thoughtful conventions that kind of just make sense? If it does I.O., does it do it resiliently 
and item potently. And last but not least, when things go bad, which they always do, does it actually give you almost magical ability to sort of understand what the root cause of the problem is and know what it is you have to do in, in literally minutes? So Swoop's magic toolbox, which is growing, involves a few of the things that I showed you. The first pattern, we call it sort of the smart data warehouse. And actually describing all the information about our own data takes uh, not more effort than actually building any one of the operations to use that data. So describing how to add a CTR column, a click-through rate column, doesn't take any more effort than actually adding a CTR column to a data set sometimes. And involves the idempotent net back operations for both SQL and file-based sources and involves root cost tooling, I showed you, which is just absolutely fabulous. This is literally, we're sometimes 100 times more productive using this. And it involves many things that I don't have time to tell you about, like how to collect application level metrics, not operational metrics during the execution of Spark, automatic data quality checkers, uh, feature engineering tools, and so on and so forth. What is, once you know you want to create magic, you know the difference between it and not it. So you can actually get to create magic. But you have to start with the intent. To get access to all this again, just send an email to spark at swoop.com. That's all I had for you. I really thank you for coming. Outstanding. We have a time for a few questions. Let's do one other thing. Since there are no talks after this, I'll stay here as late as any one of you want me to say those questions. Or we can go together drinking. So anybody can just go and leave. Feel free. And if anybody has questions, I'm happy to take them now. One question here. Hey, um, so I'm, my question is, um, when you're talking about magic, I assume you're talking about Scala implicits. Um, do you code in Scala? I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. The, the mic is, there we go. OK. So when you talk about magic, I assume you're talking about Scala implicits and using implicit libraries and classes. Um, if that's not the case, then I'd like a bit more information on what magic actually is. So and then secondly, I suppose the follow-up question is, um, Twitter's best practice is not to use implicits. And what's your sort of response on that? And how do you manage um, coding in that, in that manner? Sure. The only thing implicits get you is object.method syntax as opposed to function open paren object close paren. So magic has absolutely nothing to do with object-oriented, functional, and the exact details of object orientation. Now, the very first magical API I created was more than 20 years ago. My first startup built the first web application server. So we had a developer community of a few hundred thousand web developers. And it was completely its own programming language. It was not object-oriented. And our developers loved the language so much that our team used to get handwritten thank you notes and boxes of chocolates from individual developers. So it's a great question, but this is not Scala specific. The data patterns obviously are not related to any language. But you can achieve these kinds of capabilities in any programming language. Um, you just have to want to. Awesome. Let's give them a big hand. <laughs>